Hey everybody, I think it's uh, time for another Cove short. So this time I just thought I'd talk a little bit about these uh, weird buzzwords floating around around immutable air-gapped worm and whatnot. So let's get right into it. So, you know, I think uh, a lot of this with the advent of all these uh, ransomware attacks, there's a lot of uh, backup vendors that use these terms very loosely, and it might sound in intimidating, and, um, you know, we, we might uh, feel not worthy in our approach because we don't really understand and what, what these even mean. And, and the reality is we have a very, very nice architecture that actually delivers a reduced attack surface by default, right? So in other words, cyber resilience, um, a good architecture that uh, uh, is is not as susceptible to, uh, you know, sort of ransomware attacks that, that go after backup infrastructure don't require all this stuff. It actually requires a well-architected uh, product to begin with. So um, let's talk a little bit about what, what this even means. So immutability. So in the in the purest term, immutable just means can change it, right? You have a backup copy, you cannot change it over time. You set a retention period of say whatever it is, 28 days, and nobody, even the backup administrator, in theory, can go in and delete it, change it, edit it. And it's really a concept that came out of the compliance archival space, uh, because here we we sometimes have these legal holds. And it's very important that the evidence hasn't been tampered with and whatnot, right? And this, this concept of immutability has since been applied by backup vendors, or the term is, at least has been uh, used very loosely uh, to, to kind of represent any technology that, that renders these, these backup copies, you know, un unchangeable for a certain period of time, right? So that's really what, what immutable means. Air gap. It's really all about separation, so it's a measure to physically isolate a device, a computer, whatever, right, storage, from the network that's unsecured. So let's say you have a network where you have a bunch of servers, including Active Directory. Typically, you have a backup target, a storage on a separate network that's isolated. Now you still need to get the data back and forth. So typically what vendors do, they will, you know, uh, do like an if config, some kind of logical bringing the link up, letting the data in, then bringing it back down in order to isolate. But the reality is we don't typically have a real air gap. It's not like somebody pulling the cable, you know, once the data is synchronized and then pushing the cable back into the Ethernet port in order to connect it again, right? That, that That's not practical. So it's typically always a logical uh, means of separation. Worm, write once, read many. So it's a way to write a copy onto the storage that cannot be, well, corrupted or not corrupted, sorry, but but changed or deleted, but it can be read, right? It's, so it's visible, but you cannot edit it. So Worm is really just a technology piece for this immutability thing, right? It's a companion for the one on the top. And all of these technologies are really just there to reduce the attack surface, right? And why that is, is going to become very clear in the next picture, right? So when you look at back to the traditional approach, my favorite picture, you know, a lot of these things are network, right? You got the app server. So this could be just a server with um, a bunch of VMs. And, you know, that's obviously going to be a prime target, right? Whether that's Active Directory server, you know, they're going to go after that. And the bad guys, right, and typically try to take out your, 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 domain controller or something that really makes it very difficult for you to to do business right so that number one attack vector typically could happen through corruption you know if i get the right if i find an unpatched machine right <clears throat> or something that that has an exploit that uh you know i can just go in there and, and try to corrupt the data and then kind of cripple the business which is why we want to back that data up right so the first order is make sure you patch it Yes, it's good to harden the server, right? Just close unnecessary ports, but but obviously that that just is the case for data protection, right? You want to be backing this type of data up. 
Now, the Veeams of the world, the Datos of the world, right? They're going to have their backup server and their backup storage, their target on the same network, right? So therefore, you have to make the assumption it is possible to compromise that infrastructure. And in fact, a lot of the ransomware variants are specialized on that. Conti was one example. Um, and, you know, the backup server is, is just one sort of entity that has the catalog. So all the logic that knows, OK, this is the day, this is the copy associated with this timestamp and retention period and so forth. Right. All that logic, all that metadata, that's kind of typically what you find in a catalog. And guess what? If I corrupt that catalog, I'm not going to be able to recover. So therefore, I will have crippled your ability to recover after I actually took out the data that you would like to recover. It's going to be a problem. It's going to be likely for me to extort money. So with Veeam, for example, um, you know, that 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 uh, uh, backup software will be sitting on a on a on a server, right um, on a server, maybe on a VMware cluster. And depending on where I attack, I would have the ability in theory to either take out the hypervisor. Maybe I'll just do a low level attack, take out the server and then all the software that runs on it, including the, the backup software is really not going to be useful anymore. Right. So it's always a good practice to make sure that as a traditional vendor, you could pr pr uh, protect, in other words, back up the backup catalog as, as crazy as it sounds. But you just need to make a copy of that metadata, because if you don't have that, you know, you're not going to be able to recover. Right. So that's number one. Then you also have sort of the target, right? That is the other popular target, um, pun intended, right? That I would go after as a bad actor. It could be a, just a NAS box. And if it's unsecured, even if it's secured, right? I've seen several uh, attacks in my sort of previous life where folks would just go after that, that infrastructure and again, do a low level attack or what they might do is they might just corrupt the data. So you see that number three there, if I'm devious and I can actually get access to that data path, I can just insert all kinds of crazy data and render it useless, right? Which is why you see on the backup target, you see that not only do you want to harden it, right? Make sure you close the ports that shouldn't be open, but actually, this is where you see our backup vendors talk a lot about, oh, yeah, we have immutable copies, worm locking, right? And that's just code for I'm going to create a snap, a copy on that target such that if if the latest copy or that volume is corrupted by a ransomware or, or some kind of bad actor, at least I have these other non-changeable, uh, you know, copies to go back to further back in time in order to conduct the restore, right? That's so in other words, it, it's not like immutability and worm locking is necessarily a good thing. It's a necessary evil to protect this target because it's sitting on the network, right? So it, it's, it's actually almost a requirement because it is wide open, right? It is on that unsecured network, so to speak. Um, so, you know, the problem with immutability and worm locking is that when a, a, a bad actor does a lower level attack, kind of goes underneath the OS or does some other more, um, you know, sort of uh, devastating attacks like delete some raid groups or what have you, it doesn't matter whether the data that's on it is, is immutable or worm locked or not. It'll just be destroyed, right? So it, it helps but it is not sort of the end all be all. And then as you move to the right, and this is kind of why customers real or companies realize, well, you know, it's great. I can worm lock. I can have this immutability thing. But at the end of the day, you know, that backup target, the backup server, that's still all on the network. So now I have to start thinking about, well, how do I create another copy, that vault copy that you see on the right, that is in um, sort of an, in, in, an isolated uh, network, something that's off the, the sort of production network or the unsecured network, right? So, so that's the idea. And then the question, of course, becomes, well, how do I get the data there? Um, it has to be connected, right? Otherwise, I can't push data over the wire. That's clear. But often what, what vendors do, um, backup vendors will do, 
is they'll just you know do a sort of opening of the port for, in order to let the data flow in right and then they will close the port once the data has been synchronized and then in an automated way they will create these again another set of retention locked worm lock copies um, that they can then that, that you can then go to as a last line of uh, a defense right so the problem now is this this air gapping, this link management, and these copies that you have in the vault, guess what? They also need to be managed. So now you need to think about a policy, a separate policy that says, well, how often I'm gonna let the data come in? And you know, like what uh, you, you know, and, and what data is it that I actually put in the vault versus on my primary target? Because obviously, I'm not going to be able to afford to put everything in the vault. So you can see that the complexity just keeps piling on, right? All in an effort to really just minimize that attack surface all the way to sort of that more isolated vault copy. Right, so different attack vectors, uh, and and it's really just to convey that immutability, worm locking are just sort of a, a necessary evil because the primary infrastructure is on premise. Well, as you can imagine, you know I firmly believe there's probably a more elegant architecture, and this goes back to one of my favorite slides that I like to present when I talk to customers, uh, which is why don't we just think about sort of an architecture that we just happen to have right that reduces the attack surface by default now what i'm not showing here and we're not going to show in sort of the the enable uh, cove right uh, goodness is the local speed vault but you know we have that option right so we do have the uh, option to have a local copy right but we don't force you to do it uh, to to hop through that to then end up in a more isolated state right so this is again your sort of traditional approach you know you got all kinds of attack vectors illustrated here they're pretty much the same that i just showed on the other slide um, you know you got to make sure that your servers are patched you got to make sure that um, you have active remediation of, of any exploitable um, sort of uh, or any exploits that might be out there um, you know hardening and all that good stuff right there's only so much you can do but but clearly that's that's what you can do to take care of the app server um, but then you got sort of your, you know, the Veeams of the world, the Datas of the world, right? Whether that's an integrated appliance that brings together the backup server and the target into a single appliance, or whether their piece parts is completely irrelevant, right? So we covered that, um, and that's the picture, right? That is right there your attack vector, um, and all the hardening in the world that, you know, and then the immutability will will minimize that attack vector but it's still larger than the alternative approach which is why don't we remove that backup infrastructure and the backup target and uh, just basically have it off the network in an isolated network called the enable data center right what a concept so we have secure data centers that are SOC compliant where we have our infrastructure and we just take the data and move it outside of sort of out of harm's way just to begin with as a starting point right now of course having multi-factor authentication then further sort of reduces that attack vector in case somebody does some cred credential harvesting you know you're going to it's going to be a much taller order for someone to impersonate me you know when they don't hold a gun to my head and you know kind of have the phone there with me in order to sort of uh, authenticate right using the, using uh, the, the token or the authenticator um, so then, of course, what we can do is why don't we just then invert with the picture that we just saw, uh, which is maybe more of an on-prem first and then cloud to a cloud first, but then we can deliver sort of that latest copy, the standby image onto a server, which, by the way, can be an in, on an isolated network, but that is really something that the customer can de design with a great degree of flexibility. Now, of course, in theory, you would have to, you know, acknowledge that there is a residual uh, attack. Uh, there, there is, of course, an attack vector. So, if you want to, you know, have that the benefit of a short RTO um, by putting something back on the network, then obviously it's going to be on the network, or or at least, 
you know, um, um, in theory, there, there's going to be some exposure. But the benefit is you would get the benefit, you know, you would get the ability to, to contract your recovery time objectives a little bit. And and let's face it, you still have that copy in the cloud, right? So so it's a much cleaner approach. Uh, we just killed a couple of attack vectors. We simplified our policies. Um, and, you know, in this architecture, you you really don't need to go through hoops of using worm locked copies, immutability, air gapping, uh, just because, you know, all this infrastructure is typically on the network, right? We have the copies off the network by default. So thanks for listening. I just wanted to kind of get that uh, off my chest because we did get some questions on that. Hope it's helpful. Talk to you later.